Hey guys, make sure to stay tuned till the end of this video because I'm rolling out a new contest. This features some new merch for SLS and Starship, SLS versus Starship actually, where you can get an opportunity to win a unique one-of-a-kind piece of merch that was made by the legendary space artist Nick Henning. If you're interested in that, make sure to stay tuned to the end of this video. In the meantime, we need to talk about yet another near disaster that happened to NASA in low Earth orbit and ask the all-important question, how long are we going to keep getting lucky? So unfortunately, this animation by Dr. Stuart Gray is a bit out of date. There are now a lot more than 41,000 man-made objects in orbit, primarily because of Starlink and other mega constellations that have been deployed lately. The good news is, I suppose, that a close to parity now exists between the number of active satellites and the number of dead satellites and pieces of junk in orbit. But Nevertheless, this still complicates matters considerably. And just recently, we had a close call, yet another close call, that could have definitely complicated the situation a whole lot more and made it, frankly, impossible for us to leave our planet in the near future if things go very wrong. You've heard me talk about this many times, the so-called Kessler syndrome that could be caused by an uncontrolled chain reaction of space debris colliding with each other, and we are frankly approaching the point of no return, a sort of critical mass where there will be so much space debris in orbit that a chain reaction will be unavoidable. Some people say that this chain reaction is actually already in progress, and that in the next 50 years or so, there will be so much space junk in orbit that it will be impossible or extreme extremely dangerous to send anything out into space for at least a century. So what happened recently was a close call between NASA's Thermosphere, Ionosphere, Mesosphere, Energetics, and Dynamics mission, also known as TIMED, and a long-dead Soviet surveillance satellite called Cosmos 2221. By the way, Cosmos 2221 is a monster, a two metric ton satellite that any collision would certainly create a massive amount of space debris coming into contact with this thing. Not only that, it would certainly smash anything that it hit, including of course the timed mission as well. And neither of these satellites were capable of doing anything about this upcoming collision. Both the timed mission and Cosmos, obviously, were incapable of maneuvering at all. Although NASA did not elaborate on exactly how close the two objects came to one another, there's an organization called LEO Labs that tracks lots of space debris. They do a very thorough job of it, actually, and they posted a lot of very disturbing information. According to them, at 6.30 UTC time, on the 28th of February, so just yesterday, at an altitude of 608 kilometers, the two objects missed one another by less than 20 meters. Not 20 kilometers, 20 meters, or just over 65 feet. That's actually shorter than the length of a semi-tractor trailer in space. That is an insanely close call. So close that the objects practically collided. The only difference is, is we don't have any space debris, but that's about it. It was just dumb luck that prevented a disaster from taking place in low Earth orbit yesterday that would have had a significant impact on the International Space Station, on any of our missions to the moon, on future Starlink missions, everything we want to do in space would have been significantly impacted by this event. By how much? Well, a collision between these two objects, if they took place head on, in other words, the main center of mass hitting the main center of mass on both satellites, you would have had approximately 7,000 trackable pieces of space debris 
trackable. There would have been hundreds of thousands of smaller pieces, but the 7,000 larger pieces, the ones that could cause serious damage, well, that would have taken the number of trackable objects, the objects that are large enough for us to see on radar from 12,000 to 19,000, adding more than 50% to our current number of space debris objects. And once again, these are big objects. Smaller ones are also problematic. We just can't see them. So obviously this collision would have created a significant problem. And even if this had been a less serious collision, let's say one object clipping the other solar arrays or something like that, you would have had one damaged object and one destroyed object. And according to Leah Lab's calculations, that still would have created another 2,500 pieces of trackable debris, increasing the low earth orbit population by 20%, making space 20% more dangerous than it already is, and it's already a big problem. The International Space Station has to dodge collisions all the time. The most recent debris avoidance maneuver took place on November 10th of last year, and these events are becoming more frequent all the time as the number of space debris fragments continues to increase in low Earth orbit. And this problem is becoming much, much worse for companies like SpaceX because they're starting to deploy these gigantic mega constellations that have to dodge debris constantly. According to SpaceX and a report that they filed with the FCC, their Starlink satellites had to perform no less than 25 thousand avoidance maneuvers between December 1st of 2022 and May 31st rather of 2023. Six months, 25,000 debris avoidance maneuvers. More than 1,300 of these maneuvers were to avoid the debris generated by an internationally condemned Russian anti-satellite missile test on November of 2021, which also threatened the International Space Station for a time. SpaceX officials said in the FCC filing that the test debris remained the greatest operational risk to Starlink. Now, fortunately, Starlink satellites are capable of maneuvering and avoiding problems most of the time, but there is a small percentage of Starlink satellites that fail once they're placed on orbit and they are incapable of dodging collisions or deorbiting themselves. And the more of these dead satellites that get created in low Earth orbit, the more significant the problem becomes. And what is incredibly frustrating about this whole thing is the fact that nobody is spending a considerable amount of money on solving this problem. The Europeans are taking the lead, strangely enough, even though they have contributed the least to the problem compared to the Chinese, the Russians, and even the United States. And yet Britain alone has committed a hundred million pounds over the next 10 years in trying to do something about space debris. And there are active experiments taking place in orbit right now, trying to find the best solution to knock down at least the bigger pieces of space junk. What you're watching right now is a proposed mission, well, a proposed mission that actually took place a couple of years later that was carried out by Surrey Satellite and they had a wide variety of innovative methods to knock down space debris that they tested on the ISS. Some of these methods were more effective than others, but nevertheless, at least they tried something. By the way, the U.S. Space Force has stated that doing something about low Earth orbit and being more responsible in maintaining low Earth orbit is one of their primary considerations but they aren't spending the money. The U.S. Space Force, the U.S. military in general, has a colossal budget, and yet they're giving out prizes in the amount of maybe two or three million dollars to some of these prospective space debris mitigation companies. 
it is pathetic compared to the amount of money that's being spent by the Europeans. And to be honest, given the severity of the problem, the amount of money the Europeans are spending on the problem is pretty damn pathetic as well. Yeah, 100 million pounds may sound like a lot to the average UK citizen, but it really isn't compared to how big of an impact this could have on our future civilization, not just our space-related ambitions. If a Kessler syndrome were to take place, it would knock down virtually every satellite that we have in low Earth orbit, which would send the world economy into a tailspin. Given the potential severity of this problem, it blows my mind that we are not putting more effort into doing something about this. If you consider how much money Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are investing in their mega constellations and how much money they stand to lose if those mega constellations get smashed to bits by a Kessler syndrome, you would think they would start investing at least a few million dollars in a solution, but currently they're not. And there are a few things that make me angrier than that. Okay, let's get on to the contest. Which do you prefer, Starship or SLS? Yeah, that may sound like a really obvious question, but believe it or not, there are some very big fans of the big orange rocket out there. After all, it's gotten to the moon already, Starship has not, and it can get there on one tank of gas, which Starship will never be able to do. In the next couple of days, I'm going to be releasing a Starship versus SLS video talking about the various advantages that both rockets have. Yeah, in my opinion, Starship is the better solution, but that doesn't mean SLS is worthless, especially in the current situation. But in the meantime, we're going to have a contest to run in conjunction with this special video. If you are a fan of the Big Orange Rocket, say it proudly with this amazing design from Nick Henning, one of the best space artists out there in my opinion and I'll tell you this dynamic image I think is one of my favorites that's ever been put out for the big orange rocket and if you pull for team starship well here's your design and as all of us know size matters between now and the end of March we are gonna have a contest for who is supported by the most number of fans who purchases the most pieces of merch Whoever wins will get a special video made about their favorite rocket, either a video about Starship and some of the unusual uses that this amazing rocket could be put to in the future, or SLS and some of the unusual applications for SLS that a lot of people don't talk about. But that's not all. In addition, at the end of March, we will give out one exclusive, one-of-a-kind pieces of merch that features the Rocket Lab Neutron, the dark horse of private space flight. And that will be given out to one person from the winning team from either Starship or SLS. And to be painfully honest, I don't sell a whole lot of merch, so your odds are pretty good. So, good luck to everybody, good luck to Team Starship, and even to Team SLS. All the best, and until next time, stay angry about space.